Okay, so at the top, I think some pretty simply modeling. Uh, we think, as the motion says, given the choice to do this, this only applies to yourself. Right? We make no claims about whether or not other people still feel sorrow, etc. We think this debate ultimately is a very simple comparative. In their world, they have all the normal human emotions, including all of them. In our world, we're subtracting the emotion of sorrow. That is to say that we're agnostic on whether other emotions are good, etc. Focus the debate, for, uh, purely speaking, on this one. And as we said, you'll still feel the emotions. Okay. So that in mind, though, we have two uh, pieces of perspective material for you uh, from opening government today. The first thing I want to talk about, which is generally speaking, why as an individual, your first duty is to minimize harm to yourself. Right? So we think sorrow uniquely has harmful effects on the person. Right? First, it harms your ability to enjoy life by causing you to ignore what is happy in the world. In the sense that many times, right, if you've had that emotion of sorrow, like thinking back, right, having regret about the past, I think ultimately, like, you know, uh, sorrow comes back at opportune times, ultimately causes you to ignore what is good in the world, right, uh, causes you to ultimately give up uh, current things you should be doing because you're looking back in a retrospective way, right. Very clearly here, by depriving you of current good, I think this obviously leads to a, a net harm for you. But second, though, we think that sorrow uniquely harms your ability to form meaningful relationships or to maintain or to state them. In the sense that, for example, if you have had like a past relationship, right, this might impede uh, your, like if you had a, had, had, had a past relationship and poorly, this might uh, affect your ability to go ahead and form new ones because you're constantly thinking, what if this ends like a past one, et cetera, et cetera, right? This could be romantic, right, friendship uh, with, with your parents, et cetera. I think ultimately because relationships are so essential to the human experience are really one of the unique ways, or rather one of the unique emotions that impedes the ability to form relationships, this is probably not net, a net good. Okay. But third, though, we think that sorrow ultimately also causes real harms to your health and shortens lifespans, right? The sense that how people now, with the development of things like brain size, et cetera, we can see how, for example, psychological harms right, lead to a shortened lifespan, et cetera. I think, for example, like you as a 30-year-old probably should prioritize uh, your next 40 years, right? And during the next 40 years, you're going to have examples, you're going to have many failures, right? We think that, for example, at some point, your parents are going to pass on, et cetera. We think these, these things, these emotions, the most sorrow that happens probably from the age 30 uh, on, right? We think by going ahead and cutting it off before the point which sorrow kicks in, creates the most harm, it's probably a good thing, right? And we think in the end, you're going to live longer, you're going to be happier, et cetera. This is probably good, sure. As you allude to, sorrow is an ineliminable aspect of human existence. How does making yourself the one person in the world that cannot experience this allow you to relate to other people and allow other people sure, to sure, relate sure. to Sure, uh, sure, sure. I'll get to this later, I promise. I'll okay. The second thing I want to talk about then is that the primary benefits of sorrow, right, is to help you develop your moral intuitions during your formative years. For example, like understanding like what things are bad in the world, right? In some ways, like for example, not to touch a uh, touch a fire, uh, etc. Right? Like you have the immediate uh, sensation of pain. You might have the uh, further sensation of sorrow in case you're going to be stupid in the future, right? I think ultimately that given that you're already 30 years old, your formative memories have already happened, right? So we think that like the benefits of sorrow that accrue during the early, early life, ultimately at this point, have probably been saturated to the point in which you have diminishing returns from continuing to keep it around as an emotion, right? I think furthermore though, you still have the ability to empathize with other people. Right? Your moral intuition still exists. Because you've experienced 30 years of sorrow, you're not going to go ahead and deny that sorrow exists. Right? You'll still have the ability to be empathetic, etc. Right? Uh, we think that ultimately, this is probably uh, like, uh, uh, like at the point at which uh, uh, like a sorrow has exhausted benefits, let it go. Right? Um, and lastly, as I alluded to before, because particularly you're a 30 year old, you have much life ahead, right? I think that regret can be crippling. I think that at this point in time, when you're age 30, right, you probably want to do things like take risks, right, try new things, etc. You think that, for example, things like risk aversion that come from sorrow, right, because it includes things like regret, ultimately leads to you not being able to enjoy uh, your, the remainder of your life. Okay. So the second big argument we want to make in this round then is why we think the elimination of sorrow leads to a better decision making, right? So first, we think generally speaking, we prefer a world in which humans are more rational. Right? That is to say that they look at, for example, how to improve their end state or long-term outcomes. Right? This is impeded, we think, by human emotion. And we think that sorrow is the most crippling of these. In the sense that, for example, uh, say you want to go ahead and start a new business. Right? You might remember the past uh, a sorrow of having a business fail. Right? I think uh, the problem is that humans uh, naturally have a look back uh, bias. Right? They naturally have a, a bias towards uh, uh, like applying their past experiences to every single future uh, endeavor that they might undertake. Right? And sorrow, we think, is the most prominent manifestation of this, right? We think that ultimately, though, sorrow is actually uniquely bad, too, because it's retrospective in the sense that unlike something like fear, right, that is like biologically innate, it causes you not to go ahead and, you know, say, do something stupid like jump off a building immediately, right? Sorrow is usually reserved for instances that are more planned, right, where you have time to think on things. Right? So you don't even have a natural uh, ability to, yeah, actually, sure, I'll take it out. So if you've had a business fail, is it quite helpful to learn from that experience and be forced to learn due to the 
the emotion of sorrow that you had when that business Yeah, the, the thing is we much rather you go ahead and learn from it because a rational life story. Like, I want to not lose money is still a possible emotion as opposed to, wow, that made me feel really, really bad, right? I think, like, the problem on their side of the house is, like, people naturally apply a heuristic where somehow the past implies your future ability to succeed, right? Having a business in the uh, failing the past doesn't necessarily mean that in the future, right, you're, gonna be, uh, you're not going to be able to go ahead and be successful uh, in that field, etc. Okay. Um, our second point here, though, uh, under this is why we think that sorrow also impedes future decision making in the sense that, again, it causes you to weigh heavily past decisions, and this means that you're unable to do things like take advantage of opportunities that arise. Right? We think particularly in an increasingly like competitive world where you have you know, millions of people, billions of people coming into the world economy, etc., right? you probably want to be able to take advantage of opportunities, uh, you know, be able to adapt to increasingly changing the world, etc. The problem is, though, that in, uh, with sorrow, though, you create like a sorrow cycle. Right? Like, you go ahead and because you had a past, uh, you had like a past instance of sorrow, you don't invest in a new business or something, right? You're going to look back on that in the future and say, wow, I was really stupid to do this. But ultimately, we think this folds in on itself. We become even uh, even more and more sad because, again, you didn't take opportunities, etc. as opposed to validating something and saying, well, I tried my best, right? Move on. Don't have that regret, uh, etc. right? Uh, third, though, we think that sorrow makes you selfish, right? So, for example, when you have tough decisions regarding others, like whether, whether or not to uh, send your kid to a great school, right, uh, halfway across the country, even though, like, you, you, uh, you, you have, like, some past memory of, like, you know, not, not uh, spending time with them, etc. right? I think that sorrow causes you not to make the hard decisions for others as well, right? So this is responding directly to the POI provoking opposition, right? We think that when you eliminate sorrow by becoming like some kind of exemplar of someone who's able to make rational and relatively speaking more unselfish decisions, right? You provide an example to other people, there's also a societal benefit, right? So on their side of the house, they have to prove you, one, why you have an obligation to other people, right? But two, we think that even if you do believe that you have an obligation to other people, right, not letting your grief and your sorrow, right, uh, go ahead and let you, or rather, uh, impede you from making the utilitarian decisions that are better for everyone, right? I think ultimately speaking, limiting sorrow, that is to say, the most, uh, the, the decision, uh, the emotion that most impedes decision making, right, I think ultimately is going to lead to a net good thing. Uh, for all these reasons, we're incredibly proud to propose. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Call us in your back. Much the same way that people who can't feel physical pain but engage in extremely reckless actions and lead fairly miserable lives, I think the inability to feel what is effectively emotional pain leads to the same sort of stunted existence. Before we go to exp I will explain three things in this speech. One, what human existence is about and how emotions work. Two, why it's important to feel sorrow for yourself. And three, why it's important to feel sorrow for other people. Before that, some very extreme rebuttal. One, they said you want to live a longer life and sorrow makes you live shorter. First, I think the quality of life rather than quantity of life is more important, and they sort of admit that. Second, I think this contradicts a second point about how sorrow makes you more risk averse. If risk averse means you do less dangerous things like go skydiving, then maybe that means you live a longer life. So I don't think that's really important, they admit that themselves. Next, like small thing is why being 30 matters. They say all your experiences have already happened, so it doesn't really matter. No, like lots of meaningful experiences still exist, especially because 30 is the intersection when you have got legal agency after you turn 21 or 18, but also have enough of your own financial independence and capital to go and try new things like setting up a new business, right? These are completely new experiences which you have yet to explore, or you know, maybe having kids or something is also a fairly big and important new experience. So I think the fact that you are 30 knows that you doesn't make Sora any less important, and you'll see that later on in the argument as well. Finally, on rational decision making, I'll do more of that later, but I just want to point out that you still feel all of your other emotions that make you irrational. So you still feel pride, you still feel adrenaline, you still feel all of these excitements. So that sorrow, and which push you to do things, say so sorrow is a very necessary check, given that you aren't emotionless, I'll check out all your other emotions to make sure that you really sober and consider exactly what you're doing and whether that is the best course of, option, of, of action. So I don't think they get rational decision making, because you still have all these other emotions, like ecstasy or something, that affect how you think. First argument, what human existence is like, uh, but before that, yes. So from your reply, your case seems to imply that, or and what you said, your case seems to imply that sorrow is overall worth it regardless of pain. Will you stand behind that case? If your life seems to be going great, would you want to try and get your parents or loved one killed, killed to, to feel that sorrow? No, but we think sorrow comes naturally as the power of human or anything you try. 
unless you leave a literally perfect existence where you have never suffered anything at all, I don't think it's going to happen. But even if so, given that you know all these things are relative, right? Like that is to say, we like you know we have a much higher standard of living than people in the 1800s. We're not much more happy because we consider things right. relatively. So even if you have an objectively really good life, you're still going to feel sorrow, and we think that's a good thing and happens for a good reason. So back to my point on human existence. I think it's quite clear that human existence isn't just about having a good time because that blunts your ability to feel the highs and lows of emotion. And that's why I don't think, hold on, hold on a moment, I don't think OG or CG are going to want to just hook themselves up to a dopamine machine as their version of the good life. Yes, Drew? Look, negative emotions like fear still exist and are still able to motivate people. This is uniquely about a post hoc emotion that limits our ability to move forward after a traumatic event. But, but maybe after traumatic events, we should reevaluate our life choices and decide, why did I do that thing that led me to this traumatic event? Maybe having an LDR with someone in Cambridge wasn't that great an idea, but it still happened, right? So, you know, <laughs> this now we still leave me a over here. Um, back to my point. Um, okay. So I think what happens then is that it's quite clear that we don't just want to lead a sort of happy existence because, you know, unless you just want to put themselves up to dopamine machines or like stay at home and wank all day, in which case, not a vision of good life I think most of us would subscribe to. Uh, but I think the more important point is that where does sorrow fit into this emotional arc? And I think it's, it's quite useful to, to think about why, we, why people watch tragedies and plays, why people empathize with those things. Because the natural emotional arc is to begin with some uncertainty, like uh, you, you begin with nervousness, uncertainty about the world before you, you attempt a new thing, and if it succeeds, you feel triumph, you feel euphoric. But if it doesn't, then you feel sorrow for that failure. But most importantly, after you internalize and deal with that sorrow, and in fact, because like in a human being, if you're a healthy 30 year old, you have to internalize and deal with that sorrow, and realize that, no thank you, it is possible for you to move on. And that catharsis that happens at the end, when you realize that this one failure, despite making me feel sorrow, is not going to end me as a human being, I think, speaks to the inner strength that we seek to find within ourselves as human beings. I think that sort of emotional art, and that sort of experiencing the full tapestry of the human experience is something just lost on their side when you are unable to experience the, the sorrow that leads to that catharsis, that leads to that re-evaluation of self. Second argument, why it's important to feel sorrow for yourself. Just think about what you will never feel if you take the government's policy. You will never feel the sorrow of, of, the sorrow of knowing that if you tried a bit harder, you could have achieved your dreams. But at the same time, you'll also never feel the sorrow of knowing that you tried your damn hardest and that what you wanted didn't happen and that you failed anyway. You'd never feel the capacity for a or internalize the capacity for agency where if you've done better, you have done something, or where or, or, or you know internalize the fact that sometimes life is a bit random and no matter what you did, you never would have worked out. Why is that so important? First of all, because of your capacity for why is it so important to you, right? If they, they care about yourself as an individual. First of all, your capacity for self-improvement. We say that if you want to be your best possible self, you want to do it, it'll be good for you and good for the people you care about, then it's important that this sort of emotional check which forces you to reevaluate and think, I don't want to feel this emotion again. Why did I feel this emotion and how can I stop it from happening? So this is what I think like, so to refer to OG's example of like, maybe you're afraid to get the future relationship. No, you, learn, you think about why you did something wrong that made that relationship end because you felt so bad about it ending. And then when you go into a future relationship, maybe you don't do those things again, right? So I think that's how you ensure that you can actually have better experiences in the future rather than simply having the same ones because you don't have the post hoc fun, fun factor of like sorrow, right? Forcing you to reevaluate your past actions. But second, it also makes it much easier for you to connect and bond with others, right? So you find more people you care about. Why? Because people bond like for a whole range of reasons, uh, uh, decades of social psychology have demonstrated, over times of crisis in shared pain. When you say, I understand your pain because I know that I too have felt it. No, thank you. People bond by talking about the experiences of terrible experiences that they've had, right? It, it can be something as trivial as a round which you lost, which you didn't want to lose, or it could be something as major as the loss of a loved one, but it's often when people come closer together in the shared vulnerability of each other as a human being. I think you lose the capacity for bonding, and why is that so important? Because if they do want you to lead the best life, I think the best life is one of the varied experiences, and other people give you those experiences, but more importantly, if they just kept on feeling happy, knowing that other people are there to support you and give you both financial material and emotional support also makes you happy. Finally, I found out this, that if you do the weighing here, these are permanent improvements in your life, but sorrow is impermanent, right? It is simply one stage of how you deal with grief on the arc to becoming a better person. So you don't ignore what's good in the world. So you don't ignore what's good in the world, as OG tells you, because you get past the moment of sorrow and realize all the other things that you still have going for you. In that sense. Finally, why is sorrow for others important? I think like it's real and like I think quite simply empathy is really important doing good things for others, right? Here's where we outweigh them the whole be rational thing. You still have all of these selfish emotions that drive you not to do good things for others. The, the emotions of pride, of greed, of avarice, the seven deadly sins which I can't bother to list right now. Those emotions are things you still feel. What sorrow does is when you see another human being in suffering, you say, I understand, I feel sorrow for them 
and I want to help them, I want to stop their pain right now. That is what drives you to altruism. On the other side, you lack that capacity, you lack that capacity for empathy and the capacity for sorrow, the capacity to feel other people's pain as your own, because you yourself have never felt that pain, and you will never feel that pain in the future, you won't feel that pain for other people, even if you have felt it before turning 30. For these reasons, if you care about other people, if you care about yourself, you must oppose. Thanks for the leader of the opposition. overview, then I have three arguments. First, sorrow is not the only negative emotion. I don't think people who don't feel sorrow will grab onto hot stoves because they'll be afraid of how they feel right after. I also don't think that they'll be likely to do tremendously stupid things, one, because on an intellectual level we can gauge risk, and two, because things like fear and dread still exist in our world. The only emotion that we lose is this post hoc sorrow. I think that we can categorize emotions, and obviously some fall into both categories, as emotions which precede an event and emotions which come after an event. And it's clear that sorrow always comes after the event that causes the sorrow. At that point, the decision-making that we get is always going to be better because we lose out on the sorrow, keep things like fear and dread. The other just small thing I'd like to point out is that sorrow must be enduring over the long term if the definition from the info slide makes any sense. Clearly, this intense suffering that you feel doesn't go away 45 seconds later, as TK tells you in his speech. I think that this is problematic for their advocacy. Three arguments. First, negative emotions are valuable in as much as they affect our behavior. What does this mean? We tell you that an emotion like fear prevents us from doing things that will stop us from, you know, continuing to live, continuing to engage with other people, etc. So we tell you that fear is clearly valuable because anything you think is good in life, helping other people, helping oneself, whatever conception of that you have, is facilitated by fear. But sorrow does not uniquely prevent any of these behaviors. It may be true that feeling sorrow about something in the past delays us from committing some harmful Point action, but at the point later where fear still exists, we tell you that there is no unique benefit. They have to tell you why sorrow is good in itself, not as when conflated with other emotions. I don't think they'll be able to do that. But we also tell you that sorrow uniquely leads to worse behavior because it limits our ability to gauge future risk in an intelligent way. Jeremy tells you that if you take a chance and you get burned, you feel this sorrow, it limits your ability to take a future chance even if the risk is not really analogous. Sure. Even if, were you able to step back from your own perspective, you would see that this is a good opportunity. On our side of the house, the person that we create is someone who is more able to rationally assess the risk of new opportunities without being burdened by the harms of past opportunities. But we also tell you that people learn better from pragmatic harms than they do from sorrow. If I take an opportunity and I lose lots of money or a relationship, then I can gauge those things in terms of how they affect my own life. I'll take you later. We think that sorrow is not rational in this respect, though. I might just feel bad without really connecting that to money, to relationships. In their world, they have to prove to you that people intelligently connect this bad feeling that they have with its root cause. I think that oftentimes people suppress the reason why they feel sorrow because they don't want to engage with it, attribute it to other causes. They might link a loss of relationship and a loss of job at the same time and choose to pin this on the loss of job and ignore what's actually making them unhappy. So in their world, I think it's less likely that people are able to overcome things that harm them in the course of their lives. Our individual, and this is round winning for us, is a superior decision maker, which means that if you care about an individual's ability to help themselves and others, we will always be better because we always make comparatively better decisions without this sorrow. Second argument, and actually I'll take you now opening. The reason why post hoc emotions are important is they force you to reevaluate your earlier decisions. If you only have a feeling of fear and dread that happened before the fact, then even after everything's gone belly up, you've got no reason to reevaluate the earlier decision because you don't feel those emotions anymore. Right, except if I'm out 10 grand, then I'm probably going to reevaluate my decision making, even if I don't feel this nausea that ruins my ability to engage with other people for days or months. They have to prove that that's the benefit. Clearly, it's not. Second argument we tell you that you have a duty, I'll take you later, to minimize your own suffering. We tell you that you have a unique ability to manage yourself. Suffering is bad because it limits one's ability to interact in society with others. We tell you that in as much as people have obligations to others, you know, parents to children, husbands to wives, things like that, that you fulfill all of these obligations worse when you feel this emotion of sorrow. Why? First of all, we tell you that it is likely to crowd out other emotions. You are less likely to be proud of a child or feel love towards a spouse when you're feeling this sorrow because the emotion that we're describing is such an overpowering sensory experience that it makes it more difficult to engage with others. We think that this will therefore undermine your ability to help other people who depend upon you. That this is a meaningful impact where we are better in our world because you're better able to fulfill obligations to other people. But on top of that, we also tell you that it is easier for us to recover from harms on our side of the house because now we see clearly. 
Imagine your view on a relationship 10 days after a breakup versus 10 years after that breakup. We tell you that it's much more likely that you are able to assess what actually led the relationship to break down, how you grew as a person, how you benefited 10 years later. In their world, they have to explain to you the unique benefit of that horrible feeling a day or a week after a breakup. At the end of the day, we tell you that all this doesn't make it more difficult to move forward. We tell you that ultimately this perspective is uniquely not valuable. So. Emotions like love and joy often render us unable to make rational choices. Do you think we should also eliminate those choices in search of utility to the self in terms of monetary value? So we tell you that positive emotions have unique utilitarian value, that oftentimes the greatest experiences people have are those of love, that people seek this out throughout the course of their lives. Clearly, positive and negative emotions should be weighed differently. Negative emotions may have some disutility, but can do good things like fear. We tell you that sorrow, though, doesn't have this good preventative measure and is disutile. We tell you that fundamentally it is different from something like love, even if love might lead us to make poor decisions in some instances. So, I'm going to close with my final point regarding this ex idea that we hear from OO about what I'm going to call catharsis. Basically this idea that there is some good to feeling negative emotions in like a spiritual way or in terms of how we engage with others. Look. Even if, let's start out with this, even if they're completely right, and in our world we lose out on this catharsis, no thank you, the pragmatic benefits we get, the better ability to help others, to engage in critical self-reflection in a positive way, more than outweighs this, because we tell you that, first of all, we're the only team that can conclusively help you benefit in your relationships to others, and on top of that, that your ability to make better emotional decisions in the long term is going to outweigh this. We tell you that even if the biggest harm, one of the main harms for them is your level of some ability to relate to others. But we think that one, you're 30, you have already experienced some sorrow in your life. It's likely that even if you don't remember exactly how this feels, that you're able to be sympathetic to others. We think even if we get reduced empathy, that sympathy compensates. But on top of that, we tell you that even if you lose out on some societal connections, I don't know, you don't like Shakespeare or Euripides as much as you did before, that ultimately misidentifying the causes of sorrow, this catharsis, is not inherently valuable. That the catharsis that we feel from understanding other people's experiences does not lead us to make better decisions, and that's how you ought to evaluate this round. Even without sorrow, we tell you, you can still bond with other people. We tell you that yes, it's true, that harmful situations, that the death of a loved one and things like that bring people together, but that sympathy remains, and that on top of that, our ability to act rationally to help others after they experience this loss means that we are likely to be more useful to our loved ones after the death of a friend or a husband, whatever that may be. So at the end of the day, I think that what we've shown you on opening government is that we better improve your relationships with other people and that we make better decisions. For these reasons, I am very proud to propose. Thank the Deputy Prime Minister. Call the Deputy Prime Minister. to your emotional capacity and your affect when you cut out the ability to feel sorrow. Secondly, what is better for you materially. And thirdly, what is better for you emotionally. Firstly then, what happens to your emotional capacity and your affect, right? Because I th think they fundamentally don't engage with Kwan's first argument when he tells you that sorrow and the converse of sorrow, perhaps like joy or euphoria, are two sides of the same coin. And that it's not possible to take the set of emotions that a human being is capable of feeling, subtract one of them and cut it out without changing fundamentally how you parse your other emotions, right? And I want to actually delve into this because this is very crucial and wins us the round, right? Because let's actually investigate, and we're the first team to have done so so far, why people feel sorrow, right? InfoSide clearly lays it out for us when it tells us that you feel sorrow because you have regret or disappointment about something, right? But for you to have that regret and for you to have that disappointment about something, not doing well in a debate round, being rejected in a relationship, whatnot, requires you to have cared about that something, right? To say that I really, really care about this thing, and if I don't get it, I'm going to feel regret and sorrow and disappointment as a result of it, right? On their side of the house, by removing the ability to feel sorrow, fundamentally, we think, requires you to have not cared about that thing in the first place, right? Because otherwise, you would not have been able to access that emotion of sorrow, right? Because it's fundamentally linked to you caring about something and thus having regret or disappointment from it after the fact if it goes wrong, right? So this is why we actually contest that you'll meaningfully feel things like shame or things like fear that are like ex 
ex ante feelings because those also require you to feel and care about that thing, necessarily requiring you to also have sorrow, right? So their response, presumably, to something really, really tragic happening to you is just apathy, right? It's just not giving a fuck about what actually happened because they don't have that emotional investment or care about it. We think that dramatically hinders your capability to also feel positive emotions, right? Because feeling positive emotions like joy and catharsis and euphoria at having the thing that you cared about go right also required you to have cared about that thing in the first place, which they never access, right? So on their side of the house, yes, perhaps your emotional lows aren't as bad as on our side of the house, but it necessarily means that the emotional highs that they experience when everything goes right, when like they triumph over something, aren't ever as high, right? So this is like, I think, cleanly, cleanly wins us the round because the only offense that they have and that you perhaps experience more utility in the long run doesn't manifest, right? Instead of your emotional spectrum being from a zero to a 10, there's this from like a four to a six. So the net amount of emotions that you feel and utility that they access is the same, if not worse, on our side of the house. What else did we present to you under this? Maybe in the middle, right? The emotional arc that you experience, right? And how sorrow is a crucial component of the chronology of emotions that you experience. And by cutting out sorrow also prevents you from feeling the other positive emotions that are associated with it, right? For example, consider like, you know, the chronology of emotions you feel when you confess like your unrequited feelings to someone, right? I'm sure like I'm not the only one to have done something like this, right? Perhaps you feel like excitement and anticipation like in the moments leading up to it, right? You feel the profound nervousness and anxiety the moment that you actually initiate it, and then you feel like crippling sorrow and sadness when you're ultimately rejected, right? But <laughs> what comes after that is the crucial part, right? Because it requires you to have felt all those emotions beforehand, the sorrow that you experience, to finally arrive at the immensely and incredibly satisfying catharsis and acceptance that comes from the resolution of this action, right? And when you remove the capability to feel sorrow in between, you also remove the ability to access that catharsis and acceptance. And I think that, like, almost Almost all of us have experienced negative emotions. We wouldn't say that that net, uh, the entire experience was negative, and it's something that we'd all agree makes us better people. But that's something that they don't access as well. Sure. Um, the problem that we identify though is right. Sorrow uniquely causes what a mathematician might call overfitting. That is, you see every past activity right as the same one to now, as opposed to valuing each one rationally and individually. Like, perhaps, like, you know, like, sorrow doesn't require you to just be, like, dumb and irrational in terms of how you parse sorrow, right? As Quan identified, you can internalize the ways in which, like, past experience has gone wrong and feel sorrow and regret at those things having happened and take actions in the future to avoid those things, right? Let's move on to this. Like, what makes you better material? This is, like, the primary focus of OG, right? They just want to accumulate as many utils as possible, right? First, we'd say that we can test this on face, right? Like, they're here at a debate tournament instead of, like, sitting home and watching Netflix all day and exposing themselves to the potential to feel sorrow when they invariably lose this round. It's not the case that they only care about feeling like as much positive emotion without avoiding negativity, right? But I also think that their stance is profoundly contradictory, right? Like on one hand they say like you're going to be this perfectly rational, like superhuman actor, but on the other hand they tell you that you're going to feel all these other negative emotions and positive emotions that invariably distort your actions and your incentives and the way you act, right? So just cutting out one sorrow doesn't seem to make much impact in terms of your rationality, right? But secondly, we also say that it helps you make decisions better, right? That the introspection that you undergo after an action post facto is necessar necessitated by sorrow and allows you to make better decisions, right? On their side of the house, even giving them their best case scenario that you feel a lot of like, you know, fear and apprehension, and then things go wrong, and then you just feel nothing, right? You're just apathetic. Why is that ever going to induce you to take better actions in the future? We don't think that this is going to make you materially better off at all if it's the case that their arguments are true back half? Yeah, the debate, the, the examples of our debating show how much opening opposition cannot identify the distinction between being sad and feeling sorrow. Here, how much of your case is unique to feeling deep sorrow about your life? So like, I think a lot of it, right? Like, the, the, just, the fact that, just the fact that you can't feel, like, you can feel sorrow, but I think the distinction that we make is that sorrow, like, might last for a long time, but it's never, like, permanent, right? That all your emotions are still transient in the long run. You don't feel sorrow about something that happened 20 years ago, that even if you internalize it and feel bad for a short term, that it doesn't meaningfully affect you in the long term. Finally, what makes you better emotionally? This is far, far more impactful and consequential, right? Because people in the 1800s 
neighborhoods weren't better off. We think instead what makes you better off is being a nuanced and insightful and self-aware person. And that is what is necessitated, right? Firstly, the capacity for others to feel for you, right? To have empathy for you. We think that this is something that's precluded if you never feel sorrow for something and never enable the experience of having someone else want to take that sorrow and pain away from you. I think that precludes a lot of human experience. But more importantly, they just never articulated why it's the case that you'll be a better actor to others, right? As we identified, other emotions like greed cause you to be shitty and selfish, but sorrow, seeing another human being suffer and wanting to take that pain away from you at your own expense is what makes you do good things for them. If they say that your own self is important, we say the same justification for that means that other people are important as well, and we better help those people. We propose. Here, here. Thank the Deputy Leader of Opposition, Solomon of naturality. Unlike sadness or grief or fear of so having so much emotions of losing a debate round, this, as I said <laughs> in the info slide, and actually underlined in the info slide, is so is a deep source of sadness on the African. We are going to claim this is likely to be an actually completely change the course of my life, as they suggest, because it's going to overtake any other emotion for a long period of time, as suggested by the opening opposition. It is a parasitic emotion, likely to rob me out of my humanity and my autonomy, because it's going to make me subjective to external forces, which are not myself and therefore limit my autonomy. Three claims from the closing government. Firstly, why this actually trivializes other emotions? Why it's actually likely to make you more numb, led, uh, uh, contrary to the fact that what they're trying to claim from the open conversation. Secondly, why it actually makes me subjective to external forces which are not myself. And thirdly, why it actually likely to lead to less empathy. Note, if you're able to prove them, you essentially flip the case of the opening opposition because you're able to show you that you're going to have less of an emotional spectrum, therefore less of the human experience, therefore less of a growth, which is also what hinted by the case of CG from pure eyes. The button is therefore integrated. Note, and something is the first point here, trivializes other emotions and makes you not. This is overexposure. Let's make an analogy and then explain. This is not sadness in a sense, is marijuana. However, this is heroin. In a way, not overexposure actually does. The, 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 the tendency of individuals is to be risk averse in many cases and care much more about what they have to lose. And as they say in opening opposition, this is something which is likely to be predominant of your life for a long period of time. Even if this is something which is eventually going to fade away, the emotion itself, the complete obsession and the course that my life has taken at essentiality is something which is likely to be completely changed as they accept by the open opposition. And now note what it essentially does to me. If I I now experience an emotion to that degree, I am likely to trivialize any other emotion on the spectrum. Here is the logic of that. If I am in the army and have killed another individual, the likely scenario of that, that every other experience might seem trivial to me because I just don't understand why it matters after having that experience. Because I just don't understand why regular sadness is something that I should take into account after having the experience of losing a loved one. A day-to-day -day experience is something which is likely to be completely trivialized and numb. Note, this also has a basis in empirics, like because people that have undergone trauma in many cases lose meaning in many cases of other regions of their lives. Essentially, it just tells you that for the vast majority of us, right, because the vast majority of the experiences are the day-to-day -day experiences, the mere fact that this is something that is likely to make them look less meaningful, less objective, less of a way to actually try and have this life actually is likely to make you more numb rather than more open. But now it leads to a second interesting point in our extension. You know what? Yes, before. Right. Should we not attend the round robin because every other other today tournament is it is not shit about attending the round robin. <laughs> it is about losing your loved ones in many cases, or about <laughs> having the feeling that your individuality is at a stake, right? Let's continue to the so the second to the second claim here. Because look, in many 
cases. And this is an unfortunate thing about how society is constructed. Many of my goals, my identity, and things that happen to me are actually not self-dependent. Let's give two examples of that from two different regions. Right? If I am someone who is likely to lose a loved one in a car accident, I don't have control over the fact that this is happening to me. If I'm someone that by the design of my parents, or not, even if it's something that is part of the human experience and part of my nature still, a lot of sorrow is dependent upon the expectation caused by others. Like, if I am made to be the youngest partner of Goldman Sachs ever, I'm likely to feel sorry I'm not actually, actually likely to achieve my identity in the end of the day. But not here is the kicker of this point. Because if a lot of what is essentially ourselves, if a lot of our identity is likely to be based upon an external factors, and if I'm likely to anchor them and to overemphasize what others have dictated to me, and if I'm the unlikely to be able to adapt myself to the situation that is later for follows in the rest of my life, I am likely to be subjected to inter external forces which are not myself. I am actually likely to lose part of my autonomy as a responsible because I'm unable to construct my own identity based on the continued experience that I to follow later on, yes. So autonomy is like probably an illusion because we are subjected to all sorts of forces from our emotions. Okay. Why are you comfortable with the any emotions that, that they no, 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 here's the first thing. The fact that something is a spectrum doesn't make it an illusion. The fact that you have some sort of an influence by external forces doesn't mean that you should have le more of an influence by external forces. We simply don't accept it, and if you're going to run no free will, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> right. So let, let, let's continue. Though. So essentially, look what it does to you. Even dictated by external forces, on a philosophical level, right, the basis of uh, the rest of the emotions, the basis of my capacity to make their own decisions, the basis of my ability to shape my own life, is something which is likely to be dictated by many other decisions which are not myself. The fact that I'm likely to obsess of it over time, the fact that I am likely to, even if the feeling is going to fade away, change the course of my life, and being oversensitive for something is likely to make me not me, based on what I'm undergoing. I need to make me more subjected to external forces, which essentially means I'm going to be less of a human, though. therefore less, less likely to change it. Moreover, now, let, let's see what it does to my relationship with others. Because they say, oh, but empathy is something which is dependent. So a couple of things here. So first, the, as said, open government, although they said this is something which is going to happen later on, and I still have the capacity to feel other negative emotions, so we simply don't understand why empathy is going to go away. But look, the mere fact that I'm now going to be more aversive towards people that I love and actually need me. Because I know that if I've lost a loved one before, I'm going to be less of a capacity to try to expose myself to a, to a new wife later on, or to try to have a dependency upon other people. Because if I have an overarching, overtaking memory that is going to know that everyone is essentially going to die, my capacity and my willingness to actually try to have dependency upon other people is something which is going to be significantly reduced. Note this is something which is horrible. Why? A, because essentially the dependency upon others, as they say, is something which is crucial for the vast majority of positive experiences, as they can, they hint the POI from CO as well, and most of, most of the cases of O. And the fact that I'm in order to actually have maintained empathy and to have constructed of other feelings is something which is also dependent upon others. If this is something which is likely to happen to me, this is bad. Let's add another thing here. This is something which happens at an early age. I do not have the capacity to know this is something which is going to happen to me. These experiences are likely to be so bad, so at the moment of making the decision, I need to have the understanding that this is something that might happen to me and the expectation of these events are so horrific because of it, it essentially means that at the point I make the decision, the logical thing is to be able to maintain my autonomy and to make sure that my agency is preserved because note, if what I care about is my capacity to actually be myself and to have agency to be part of the human experience, let's remove the parasite that is actually not allowing us to do so. So let's propose this incredible idea. Thank beautiful emotion like that is genuinely what we think this round is about is about how sorrow is something that is key to that human experience allows you to create narratives about your life and allows you to reflect on your life in ways that are incredibly productive we're going to extend to you our extension is just called sorrow is a beautiful emotion because this is basically the ode to sorrow so the reason that sorrow is such a beautiful emotion is because of its intensity like the problem with emotions is that oftentimes we don't even recognize we're experiencing those emotions the beauty of sorrow is that it forces you to grapple with the fact 
that you're having an emotional interaction with yourself. Like, one of the most important things about sorrow is something that all of Gov Bench touched upon, which is that it forces you to be retrospective, it forces you to turn inward, it forces you to grapple with the feelings that, and sensations that you're having, yeah. which we totally stand behind, because we think at the point at which you turn inward, it allows you to access that human experience in a way that cannot be accessed through other emotions, because you aren't forced to turn inward by other emotions. That's basically the premise of the Gov case, is like, look, other emotions aren't as restrictive, which is good. The problem is, is that with that lack of restriction, it also comes with a lack of attunement to the emotions that you're having, and a lack of ability to actually grapple with the ways that those emotions influence your life. But it also what we tell you is, like, life is really boring. Like, most of our experiences are not that interesting. And sorrow is a really fascinating way to make life interesting in a way that it usually isn't. Because if sorrow is such an intense experience, that intense experience allows you to really experience that life you are having. Because it means that you actually have to grapple with that emotion, engage with that emotion, experience it in a way that you don't with other things. But additionally, we tell you is that emotion, essentially, like the way we experience life and the way we experience important moments is through positioning them in a narrative arc about how we experience that life. So most of the ways that we conceptualize our identity and especially retrospectively conceptualize that identity is by putting certain moments into a narrative place within how our life operates. The importance, therefore, of sorrow is that sorrow was really key to conceptualizing that narrative arc. Because oftentimes when you have experienced sorrow, it allows you to have that one narrative moment which you then overcome later in life. It allows you to develop a sense of self that actually is really critical, right? Because at the point at which you feel like you've overcome that sorrow, it's a super powerful narrative for you to have rather than one where you just made a lot of good business decisions and got more money from it. Yeah. So at the moment in which I'm overcoming my soul, even if you don't accept that this is something which is going to happen, I am not myself anymore. Because essentially, an external force had hijacked the personality that I had before. This is something which is likely to rob me of every experience that you're trying to have, even if some of it might be a bit more. I'm like not sure why sorrow isn't yourself, right? Like I think sorrow is the time when you are most yourself, because it is the time at which you are most introspective. It's the time at which you are most attuned to those emotions in a way that you never are in other circumstances. So like it's unclear to me why sorrow somehow rips you away from the self. I think oftentimes also because sorrow forces you to be so retrospective, it makes you be incredibly engaged with yourself and engaged with those moments in the past when you've done certain things in a way that I don't think other emotions force you to do. So I think actually it's like a way in which we access the human experience if that's what CG wants to talk about in a much more powerful way than is possible with many other emotions. We also tell you that it just allows life to be a dynamic experience. Like I, I like the word dynamic, so that's mostly why that sentence came out. But I think it's a really key element of the human experience. So the second argument we want to extend to you is about how it allows you to better experience other emotions and other emotional sensations. So I think Oo touched upon this, but didn't explain how this happens. The reason this is important is because it gives you that comparison. It allows you to actually experience those moments of happiness. But the real key thing here is that when you experience sorrow, if the arguments I just presented you are true, then it makes you more able to tune into those other emotions at the point at which you have had experience, experiencing those intense feelings. So at the point at which you have experience, having intense feelings, it makes you more able to really lean into the emotions that are more positive as well. So it means that when you have those other experiences, you're far more attuned to the fact that you're actually experiencing those things. We also tell you it's just absolutely necessary for you to have productive relationships with other individuals, especially as you age. So this is important, right? You're never experiencing this for the rest of your life. The problem is, is that presumably many people around you will grapple with sorrow. Yeah. The response we get from Gov is just, well, you've experienced sorrow at some point, so I guess you can empathize. The problem is shared experiences of sorrow, right? These are much more common to happen as you age particularly. These are going to be around people who are losing their parents. You might be in a relationship with someone who's lost their parents. You might have friends who have uh, experienced trauma. The problem then is that when you both experience an event, you have incredibly different experiential interpretations of that event. So the person who can't feel sorrow has a very different reaction, which means that those two individuals are incapable, essentially, of experiencing that shared emotional response. And the reason, like, if the human experience is only important because of shared emotions, presumably that's important because at the point at which you are able to share those experiences and share those emotions, it's far more productive when you can grapple with those together. Yeah. The way that we interact with other people has tremendous pragmatic effects. You are less able to fulfill obligations to others when you have this fundamentally introverted experience of sorrow. Like, I think 
think sorrow is both introverted but also forces you to seek out networks of emotional support. So like even if it is introverted in the sense that you become incredibly introspective and inward looking about how that emotion is impacting you, you also find networks of support in order to allow for you to have other individuals who have also experienced sorrow. This is like why trauma survivors often form support networks because it's a way in which you reach out to individuals that you are not forced to do otherwise. Like, this is a huge problem, right? Other emotions do not force you to find support in the way that sorrow does. So that's key, right? Like if sorrow is the emotion that forces you to find those networks of support, you won't get that as a result of feeling happy because there's no necessity for you to seek out those other things. And additionally, like seeking things out and doing things is kind of hard. Like there's never any clear immediate benefit to most of the things that we do. So in those cases, the thing you need to inspire you is the feeling of sorrow because that's something that you can tangibly grapple with instead of the nebulous, maybe I'll make money out of this business. Like, I think it's far better if you have the immediate motivator of wanting to escape the emotion of sorrow, which you can't compare, to, like you won't have any sort of motivator at the point at which you aren't sure what the payout benefit of that particular experience is going to be. So we think that sorrow is necessary to actually motivate action in a way that I don't think anyone on the gut bench has grappled with. But I want to deal with this diminishing autonomy argument that we get out of CG. So the diminishing uh, autonomy argument essentially is the idea that sorrow is so overwhelming that it renders you incapable of doing anything else. I think first of all we kind of know this isn't true like most of the people in this room have probably experienced sorrow but are also doing things with their life so I don't think it's the case that that's so bad but also all sorts of things change the course of your life. We think sorrow often changes it for the better because it allows you to experience other emotions, it allows you to seek out support networks, and it allows you to actually like find if it diminishes your autonomy if the results of that diminishing autonomy are good. For these reasons, proud to oppose. Here, here. Three clashes in this debate. One, what is sorrow and what types of sorrow matter in this debate? Two, how terrible sorrow really is. And three, do we need sorrow to achieve the other benefits that we've heard about in this debate? First, let's talk about opposing opposition because my response to them is the same response throughout the opposition line. We've heard a lot of benefits to sorrow. There's the beauty of sorrow. It helps us turn inward. Life is really boring when you're not sorrowed. You yeah. get to share experiences with others. You find groups of support. Great, you have an extension, these are things that are nice about sorrow. Let's be somewhat comparative here. When a father loses his child, let's say he's in the military or in a car accident, no one in their right mind would ever trade that feeling to look more inwards, to uh, help find more groups of support. We think it would be offensive to anyone who knows anything about this type of feeling to think that it would be that it would be worth it. My point here is not that it is offensive, I'm not going to make an complaint. I'm going to say that any person who knows anything about these feelings knows that this is incredibly non-comparative. More specifically about the opposition's case, it's also worth practically mentioning that they have a very naive, optimistic view that everyone just finds all these great opportunities that they're talking about. That everyone looks inward and then finds a stronger self. That they find groups of support, rather than many other people who, no thank you, don't find groups of support when they are in times of need. Some people commit suicide. Some people feel that they are weaker now because they cannot deal with the pain that they have. So we think that also, kind of the specifics, their case doesn't really stand in many of the cases. Let's talk about what is sorrow and what types of sorrow yeah. Because as we've mentioned several times by now, sorrow is not sadness. There is a deep difference, and losing a debate does not cause sorrow if you're not MDG, and I know it. <laughs> <laughs> and pet. Uh, but you have, to, you have to judge this as a reasonable, intelligent voter, okay? So. <laughs> okay. Uh, Note, even if under the definition of sorrow, there are some types of sorrow that are more shallow, that are not deep pain such as losing your son, we think that is less important in this debate. It is important to remember that we all have a substantial risk 
of losing our loved ones. We have a substantial risk of being in a car accident and being either ripped for life or losing the one we love. No, thank you. These are risks that we love to ignore, but are part of all of our lives. And those risks should dominate our decision making. Because even if we could have somewhat better planning and somewhat better learning experience, no, thank you, we think taking care of those risks is most important. Let's talk about how terrible sorrow is. So, from opening opposition, we get this idea that, look, it's good in and of itself. You'll never feel the feeling of, 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 of uh, trying and, and, and failing. We're not sure why that's an end in and of itself. We don't think they've explained that. No, thank you. Opening government tell us there are a lot of practical problems. You can plan much worse. Uh, you can't plan as well. You, can, you don't notice other sources of happiness. And we think they explain well what those practical harms are to feeling sorry, sorrow. But Dunn tells you of, a more, of an existential pain and inability to be yourself. No, thank you. And he does this in several ways. And here I want to engage with what we've just heard from closing up the responses. So one, he says, look, as a result of this sorrow, I am no longer the person I was. I don't care about the same things. I don't love in the same extent that I did love before. And I don't, and I'm incapable of making decisions that I would have. I might want to go to work. I want, want to connect with my girlfriend on a deeper level, but I'm just not available emotionally to do that right now. Yes? We asked, and you never answered. If you don't feel sorrow when your loved one dies, in what way can you say you care about them? So, I'll, I'll get to that, but we don't agree that you need the full extent of sorrow that you need to defend in this debate. But we'll talk about that in the third clash of do we need sorrow for other things. But here's the important part, because closing opposition say, in what sense does this harm your autonomy? If someone were to take me away from my family against my will, that would be a terrible crime for which we would punish them. We would personally hate them and we would expect the state to punish them. Now, this mechanism of sorrow enables arbitrary results, a car accident that I wasn't even in, that I didn't even choose for my loved one to drive on, to completely change and take away either my relationships, my identity, or my emotions. By definition, this is a breaking of my autonomy. If people were capable to completely control their external influences, we might accept that as a part of my autonomy. And I might, some people, I think no one would, but I might want to change and see my loved one die. But if I am not given that choice, that is a break of my autonomy and my identity without my consent. And therefore, we think that is a terrible thing. I want to go back to what I started with in this argument. Look, no father who has lost a child would ever trade off this feeling, either from the benefits of our position side, or even for better ability to plan, better ability to notice happiness. This means that anyone who knows anything about the consequences of this debate knows this pain, this existential pain and changing of who you are is the most important thing in this debate. And that's why cloning government should win. But now, no thank you, let's talk about what we get from uh, money on the opposition side and whether we really need sorrow for those things. I asked opening opposition in a POI, what, if they felt they didn't have enough sorrow in their lives, would they go around killing their loved ones or trying to arrange for that to happen? And they said, obviously no. But why do they say obviously no? Broadly they say, look, even though we don't all have terrible lives, we all at some point in our life feel some sorrow, and even if it's not you know, an existential sorrow of losing the person we care about most, we feel a lesser amount of sorrow. Question. We think this is a critical concession in this debate. Because if we are capable, if it's all right, if you get to those advantages by sometimes having sorrow, by having a lesser type of sorrow, we think that means we don't need that. Closing. Okay, so presumably the car accident still happens on your side of the house, but now you have no capacity to mourn the death of that individual. Isn't that also a reduction in autonomy because now you can't determine how that life is shaped? Two, two answers to that. One is we think that being very sad is a way to mourn that person. Secondly, though, there's no hard to autonomy because now we are debating whether we choose to take that part of our lives ourselves. So we think it's a good idea, but it is your choice to take that away, whereas you don't have that autonomy if you allow any situ external situation to take that away from you. Note, other than what I've just told you, why the concession we get from opening opposition means we don't need these types of sorrow to get that, note that A, they claim that we need that to care for others. But Dan's analysis about how sorrow affects us explains why we, the ability to understand the pain of others is greatly reduced. When I feel there is an intense pain, I don't know why it matters that that person has only lost a leg. I have lost everything. I don't know why these things matter. The same applies to a full spectrum of emotion. By feeling the extremes, you lose the ability to feel the spectrum in beneath. What have we told you today? We've told you, A, 
that you don't need the sorrow to experience most of the benefits that we've heard about this inside. But most importantly, the worst kind of sorrow, anything we've even discussed in this room, of everything we've discussed in this room, is the existential pain of the cases in which I genuinely feel sorrow. We beg each other. two things in this speech. First, is it beautiful? Second, does it take away your individual utility and your ability to actually self-actualize the interactions with others? But first, because I think it's the most important, is it beautiful? OG actually warranted this for us in a nice fashion at the very beginning of this round. They told us that sorrow is unique because it forces you to turn inwards in a retrospective manner, and they told us that this is a reason why it is distinct from other types of things, like pain, which are necessarily different from that force turning inwards. Zoe expands upon this in extension. She tells you what the impact of that turn inwards means. Basically, it is an extreme emotion, as we also have heard from closing government, but it is an extreme emotion that is good for you at the point when it allows you to experience something that you otherwise would not, when it allows you to consider something that you otherwise would not, and as I will posit throughout the speech, at the point when it actually allows you to be your most self, because it is at the point where you consider what your actions have done, how you have gotten to that point, in a way that we simply do not when we live our blasé lives for the most part, simply going down the path that we have been put on. I think sorrow is unique because it forces you to self-remove from like whatever substance of reality it is at that point in time, if you understand that vague metaphor, and at that point, understand who you are. Uh, it was once said, if you don't look around sometimes, you may miss what happens. Like, that's the point here. Like, sorrow forces you to look around, yeah. and at that point, yes. we think it's incredibly important. So. The, the, the articulation here is it's not just that you don't really have the ability to know happiness, as we heard out of opening opposition, it's that you don't have the self-recognition that it is interesting, and not just interesting, in your interest to lean into happiness when it does occur, because you come to value it even more because of the juxtaposition between that emotion and your consideration of yourself through this experience of sorrow. In the previous whip speech, we heard this argumentation that you wouldn't oh, want yes. to have a loved one lost in a car crash. And like this is like this is true, right? But at the point where if you do have that occur to you, we would want okay. you to have the ability to grieve. And grieve in a fashion that is not related to, oh, that car cost ten thousand dollars. I have a monetary loss here, but grieve in a way that recognizes the spectrum of emotions, as Zoe told you, then actually take you upon that path in order to form relationships with others who are also in that process and have that identity and actually self-actualize following it because it is an important part of the spectrum of emotions. Like, events that cause sorrow will happen on either side of the house, speakers. This debate is about how you necessarily react, and we would posit that it is better to grieve and have that spectrum rather than ignoring that for the reasons that are purely philosophical, but also, as I'll explain, because we think it limits your ability to identify and to form relationships with others, opening first. Okay, so you, I think you just admitted, right, that like through utilitarian calculus, you can get to the same end result, right? If that is true, then, why go through the process of sorrow if your decision-making calculus puts you in the same place? No, 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 it's not the same end result, speaking. Like, grieving a $10,000 loss, like, does not equate to the same self-change that would occur if you actually grieve on a deeper level, right? Like, $10,000 to a lot of people just isn't enough to actually cause that concern as well. So there's diminishing returns if you are in the 99, or the 1%. The silly argument, but the point is clear. So closing government then talks about, it is not beautiful, intrinsically, because instead of being beautiful, it is a parasite. You are not yourself. Speaker, you have to understand that this is a fundamentally flawed argument for a few reasons. I'm going to list them off here. First, as I explained, it is a moment at which you are most attuned to who you are. We think that is beautiful and not a parasitic interaction. Secondly, it is unclear that simply because it is powerful, it is therefore illegitimate, right? Like, lots of emotions, like an excruciating pain, can be very powerful, but it is still a legitimate part of you, and it is a uh, redu reduction of your ability to self-actualize and have autonomy if it is removed, right? At the point when we recognize that 
over time, you're doing this at 30, say age 70, you lose a loved one or you have a friend that loses a loved one, you have a diminished ability to empathize with others and to actually feel the emotion itself because it has not been part of your life for the past 40 years that is actually reducing your autonomy in a concrete manner because you are not allowed to grieve because you simply do not have the power to even recognize the like, mediocre sadness that closing government then tried to cage the argument on. But also, like, Zoe told me not to say this, I'm going to say it anyway. Midlife crisis can be really, really good, right? Like you may support the auto industry by buying more cars, but besides from that, it is entirely irreconcilable to me to not, not recognize that an individual who goes through that crisis and then becomes a person as well is no longer a rational individual who has just had a change in experiences. Like you can still recognize that you are an individual and we think that it is the process that is important in that regard. And as also Zoe pointed out, like most normal 30 year olds as we've talked about here, like can experience all their emotions in a non-trivial manner, even if they've had the crushing sadness that we've been talked about uh, uh, on closing governments. Finally then, let's talk about does it take what utility before I go on closing. So here's the issue with SEAL. At the best, they do a chart picking of some examples and actually, actually assume the burden. The vast majority of people are not able to find support groups that actually have a worse continuation of their life and even the ones that are able to do so are not able to forge okay. meaningful relationships but actually have a very so, set of So the thing is, the past. like the vast majority of people may not be able to find a support group, but the vast majority of people create a self-identity based off of having friends. At the point when we understand this motion and this model, the everybody else will still experience sadness. We think it's ridiculous to presume that at age 30, you are able to recognize the full extent of sadness, right? Like as it's explained up and down our bench, certain things happen after that age that are unique. And we would posit that like this is the premise that takes out a lot of the government analysis. Because at the point when you want to have relationships in order to actually gain utility as opening government is so concerned about, if we have proven to you that you will be less likely to have those successful and in-depth relationships because you will not be able to empathize and create bonds with people in a circumstance that allows you to do that in the highest fashion, that is an argument that takes down a lot of their analysis. Right? This is why the, the government line that sorrows inward uh, is so important. And Zoe's unique articulation is that it's a necessity to actually have sorrow in order to do this, uh, in order to not just fake like you are uh, having an equivalent reaction or equivalent uh, understanding because at age 20 you like failed in propositioning someone and that would cause internal trauma forever, right? Like, finally, opening government talks about how like you'd have to take it like an ex nearest neighbor, ten years neighbor's approach to all future experiences. We just simply don't think that this is a clear trade off, right? Like if you lose the relationships, you won't be able to even gain any utility. Making that argument move into this round. At the end of this round, you have to understand that happiness is unique. It is important. It is powerful, and that is a reason why it is beautiful and why you should pick up. Speakers, Dr. Bush, again, Mark, as well.